It's the Happy Families Podcast. It's the podcast for the time poor parent who just wants answers now. And our emotions are like leaves in rivers. They float past and then they disappear. The reason that the emotion stays for a long time is because we dam up the river. We try to block the leaves from floating away. And now here's the stars of our show, my mum and dad. Every Tuesday on the Happy Families podcast, we answer a listener question. You can send your questions to podcasts, that's podcasts with an S, at happyfamilies.com.au. My name's Justin. I'm here with Kylie, my wife, and mum to our six kids. We've got a few years of um, parenting experience between us, haven't we, honey? Our our eldest daughter is 23 and a half. We're coming up to our 25th wedding anniversary. It's just around the corner. And uh, we have six daughters. Our youngest is still in primary school, grade three, eight years old, about to turn nine. The clock's ticking. We've got 10 years to go, Kylie, until we no longer Stop have any dependents. It feels so far <laughs> away. That will be a combined total of 33 years, 33 years of parenting children from the time we had our firstborn until the time our last born turns 18. So here's the thing. Though. 33 years. It doesn't ever end. Honey. I know, I know, I know. But that's uh, that's the whole, we've got kids in the house that are dependent on us. I look at how much our parents go through now that they've got adult children, like properly adult children. In fact, my parents just became great grandparents. That's crazy. That is crazy. So they became grandparents, obviously, when we had our kids. But I have a sister who had uh, a, a, a child daughter. very young, a daughter very young, and that daughter has just had her first baby very young. So my parents are great grandparents. They're not even seventy yet, and they're great grandparents. I think it's phenomenal. It's amazing. <sighs> so we're not here to talk about that, but that's who we are. We've got a few. We've got a few years of parenting experience under the belt. Is all I'm saying. Uh, and I've got a PhD in psychology. I love to talk about how to make families happier. Today's question, Kylie, comes from somebody who wanted to remain anonymous. They've just signed their email to us, Jay, with an X. I guess the X is for a kiss. Uh, They've said, hi, Kylie and Justin. I have a six and a half year old daughter, intelligent and sassy, but also can be extremely sensitive and finds it hard to separate from hubby and I, but especially me. This has been an ongoing issue since she started daycare at two years old and continues now as she's in grade one. Growing up, the term sensitive was applied to me, but always in a negative way. You're too sensitive. You shouldn't think that way. I know now that it can be a wonderful, amazing thing to be sensitive, but I'm very conscious of others labeling her in the same way they labeled me. Also, how can I guide her so that her sensitivity does not cause her so much emotional distress? She struggles so much already with the separation issues, attempts school avoidance, and finds the ever-changing dynamics of little girl friendships so difficult. Would love to hear your thoughts, Jay. So, Kylie, there's a few things to talk about here. We've got uh, the sensitivity, other people's judgments. We've also got school avoidance and little girl friendships being difficult. A whole lot to talk about, a short podcast. This is the podcast for the time poor parent who just wants answers now. So I think we'll see if we can help Jay with just some Kickstarter ideas on each of those things. Where would you like to start? What about if we start with what other people are saying about your sensitive child? I think we can tick that one off nice and quickly. I think that mums are keenly aware of it more so than dads. Is this the mother guilt thing? Or do you think it's something else? I think it's the mother bear in us who wants to protect. We we have this deep need to protect our kids from hurt. Yeah. Not the physical hurt that I think dads are, are keen to protect them from. I, that emotional hurt because we've experienced it at such, you know, an intimate level ourselves as younger children. And so for me, the thought that somebody would think badly about my child, they don't even have to say it, just that they would think badly or view my child in a negative way. Yeah, you don't want your child to be misunderstood. It's heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's heartbreaking. So what I'm about to say is going to feel so harsh. Really? You're going to say something provocative? That's my job. (laughs) Look at you go. And it's something that I struggle with to this day. Uh Uh-huh. But I heard it and it makes so much sense if only I could live it. Yeah, what, what is it? It's really none of my business what other people think. I don't have any control over it. There, I, I could manipulate every possible situation to frame my child in a positive light and there will still be someone who will see them <laughs> in a bad way. I hear you. Because 
That's their choice and their prerogative. But we still want them to think nicely about our kids. I know it's not our business, but we really want people to like our kids because we see our kids as an extension or a reflection of us. And if they don't like our kids, that can feel like we're being rejected. Totally. And I guess that's where building the village is so important. Uh Uh-huh. Finding safe people who love your children. We had a child who had massive emotions, massive emotions, and she she literally did not get invited to birthday parties. She wasn't included in any social outings. She was not able to be, you know, socialised with other people yeah, because totally. parents had decided her big emotions meant that she was not a child that they wanted their children to associate with. Yeah. And yet there were a handful of people who saw her for her and – Fiercely, I'm talking fiercely. They became like second mothers to her. Mm. They loved her. And to this day, they are a safe place for her to go. And they're the people you want in your corner. Yeah. Because you can't, you can't, you can't change the whole environment. You can't, you can't fix everybody. And and it's not just the, I mean, I know there's some judgment out there and I get what Jay is saying in this email that, Uh, I don't want my daughter to be judged as being sensitive, but people are going to make judgments about our kids no matter what. And they might judge them as being sensitive or they might think that they're too boisterous or they're loud or they're arrogant and they think that they know everything. Like there's always going to be some judgment and our job is to be comfortable enough in our own skin that we're okay with other people thinking things about our children because those other people, they're getting a snapshot, they're getting a moment in time. They don't really know what our child is, who our child is, what they're capable of. And further to that... They've got it's, – it's important for all of us to remember that children are on a tremendous developmental trajectory. And this snapshot, this moment in time is just that. Tomorrow, next week, next year, you will have a somewhat different child. Sure, some characteristics are uh, consistent and stable over time, but the child still grows and learns and matures and develops them. Your idea kind of ties in with something that I wanted to say, not about – being sensitive to what other people are judging about this little six and a half year old, but rather the the sensitivity that the child has. I want to, again, say something that's a little bit provocative, a little bit hard here, but I think it's really important. And that is be careful not to put your own labels onto a child. You were sensitive. Now you're saying that you've got a sensitive child, but uh, children are sensitive, but they're also not. They have their moments in every direction. Yeah, but I think also there's an acknowledgement that she's now coming to a place where she's learning and recognising that being sensitive doesn't necessarily have to be a negative thing. Yes, and, and, and the, I think our whole community is coming to that recognition. The opportunity she has to help her child recognise and see that being sensitive is actually a blessing, but it comes with a heavy burden at times because you feel so deeply and you experience the good and the bad. But without the bad, we don't actually get to feel the full experience of the good. And so it it feels like a double-edged sword, but it can be so just – life can be so much more fruitful if we're willing to, you know, really feel and live into the experiences that we have. So to extend on what you've just said and sort of round out what I was going to – suggest in terms of this child's big emotions because the child clearly does have some sensitivities and wants to not separate from mom not separate from dad uh is struggling a bit with school uh we've got the school avoidance i would i would add we need to become comfortable with our children feeling uncomfortable at times because when we demonstrate unease at our child's big emotions our child is actually going to receive some level of reinforcement from seeing our discomfort with their discomfort Whereas if we well, can, it reinforces the fact that they should feel that way. Precisely, Mum feels uncomfortable about this situation. So clearly, there's something here that I can't see. Right, it's bigger than me. And then we get this this negative emotional spiral as each person feeds off the other. There's a, a contagion to that emotion. Emotions are contagious. So what I would say to Jay is take a breath, and when your child is feeling uncomfortable. Maybe detach yourself a little bit from the outcome. Detach yourself a bit from the emotion. Obviously, you care very much about your child. I'm not saying detach yourself from your child, but just recognize, well, right now my child's having this big emotion. I I used to love to use the metaphor, and I haven't done it for a long time. I haven't been asked to teach the anxiety content for a while, but I used to, uh, in my anxiety workshop, talk about the visualization of a leaf floating down a river. 
And you can watch the leaf fall out of the tree, hit the water, float down past you as you sit on that beautiful grassy riverbank in the sun. Watch that leaf float down around the river bend until it's out of sight. And our emotions are like leaves in rivers. They float past and then they disappear. The reason that the emotion stays for a long time is because we keep feeding it. We, we dam up the river. We try to block the leaves from floating away. We say, oh, you're having a big emotion. We need to talk about the emotions. No, this is a controversial thing to say because I'm, I'm aware that in our current way of thinking about psychology of emotions that we really do elevate emotions and we pay attention to emotions. Emotions are data. Emotions uh, tell us so much. But sometimes I think we elevate emotions too much. Sometimes I think that we focus so much on the emotion that somebody's having. We focus so deeply on their emotional experience. We get so invested in the emotion that the emotion begins to drive everything that we're doing in terms of the way our household functions, the way we interact with other people. Sometimes it's okay to say, you're having a really big emotion right now, aren't you? Let's just watch that emotion float around the corner like a leaf in a river, and then we'll get on with things. So have the emotion, let it happen safely, but don't make a big deal about it and just get on with it. And I think that that's where a healthy appreciation for emotions happens, when we're able to acknowledge the emotion and then let it go. Yeah. That, that's, the, that's the trick. It's like my is train. being able to let it go. My train in the tunnel metaphor. The train will always come out of the tunnel. It goes into the mountain, it comes out the other side. Sometimes the tunnel is really, really long, but there's no point pulling out the earth-moving equipment and starting to make a big mess by digging up the mountain to pull the train out. It, it will come out eventually with no mess whatsoever if we just say, okay, big emotion, let's give it an hour, let's give it 10 minutes, let's give it a day like I had to with you just recently, and the train comes out of the tunnel and things get better. So having worked in childcare in our early days of marriage, one of the things that always used to astound me before I was a parent was to see these massive emotions of children, mm. I was working in the toddler room, massive emotions um, with our children as mums and dads tried to say goodbye and walk out. And then as soon as mum and dad left. <laughs> They're running and playing and happy. It, it was like a light bulb switch. Yeah. And, and they they had completely changed their tune and they were okay. And so often the separation anxiety that our children experience is actually feeding off the anxiety that, that we, we have yeah. for leaving them because we feel bad. Yes. And it's really, really hard to get over that. But if we don't come to terms with our own separation anxiety, then our children never will it will just continue to feed on each other. And so the power in recognising that your child, you, you are literally taking your child to a safe place. They have teachers who love and care for them and they will have a great day. If you can live into that and walk away, nice, calm, cool, collected. But, and compassionate and kind. It's not like you walk in and say, you're safe here. Have a good day. And you walk away. It's, it's not cold. There's nothing harsh. No. And, and I'm not even sure if that detachment word that I used earlier is, is, the right is the right word. Because you are attached, of course. But there's an emotional stability. There's an emotional confidence that we want to have as parents to help our kids realise, yeah, we get it's hard, but we know that you'll be okay. Conversations in the car, pre-arming our children about what's going to happen. Mum's going to get there. We're going to put your bag away. We're going to say hello to your teacher. And then mum's going to give you a cuddle and a kiss and I'm going to leave. I will be back at three o'clock. They can, you know, she's six and a half. So she can read the time on the clock. She knows. And then, and then once I pick you up, we're going to go and visit grandma. Or we're going to go to the park with your friend. Or whatever it is, pre-arming them about what's going to happen. And then giving them something to look forward to at the other end of the day can be really powerful as well. So the last thing we need to talk about is school avoidance and those challenging friendships. We've uh, got a really great article online about dealing with when school feels horrible for kids. And I also had one about school refusal that I wrote last year. We will link to both of those articles in our show notes rather than talking about it at length in the podcast because there's so much we could talk about. I just want to mention a couple of things. Friendships and relationships, if we can build great relationships at school and also great relationships outside of school, I think you're going to find uh, that, that kids tend to want to be where their friends are. And so if they've got some relationships that have been built in a healthy way at school, they're much more likely to want to be there and school should go easier 
the higher the quality of the friendships at school, the easier it goes. But also have friendships outside of school so that f- school isn't the only place. Because it can be a dynamic place. Friendships chop and change a lot. And so we want to give kids every opportunity in and outside of school. Well, I think the last thing is just to remember that friendships, relationships, and all of this big emotion stuff, it just takes time. Yeah. And kids will there's, mature. there's a level of age maturity that needs to take place for these things to fall into place for some kids not all kids some kids just fall into life and everything seems to be easy for them but there are other kids a little bit more sensitive who just struggle and it's a time thing and we're watching that with our children it's funny going full circle to the start of our conversation we were talking about all the years of parenting experience that we've got with so many children and so many years of this and i reckon in understanding jay's email if this was our first child, our six and a half year old, going through this. We would have been so worried. We would have been so concerned about this sort of stuff. Having been through it as many times as we have now, it's actually one of those things where if we can take a breath and say, you know what, I've got to trust. I, I, I can trust in my child's innate desire to create healthy relationships. Just having that trust in them is probably enough. I feel so differently about it now than how we, you and I would have felt about it 18 years ago when we were going through it ourselves for the first time. Yeah. And and Jay, I guess the, the last piece of advice, therefore, would be take a breather and trust. Just trust that your child is organismically designed to find a way through this and to do it in a healthy and productive way. You just create a, a supportive environment and she'll be all right. The Happy Families Podcast is produced by Justin Rulon from Bridge Media. Craig Bruce is our executive producer. We so very much appreciate that you listen to the podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast, well, I'm going to be really honest about it, and I hope you don't mind me saying this, Kylie, but we want more people to listen to the podcast because it will make their family happier. So if you could take like 30 seconds and leave a quick review at Apple Podcasts, just five stars. Here's what I love about the podcast. And when you do that, Google and Apple and all of the algorithms push the podcast into the feeds of people who might also like it. It's your reviews that make it more visible. So please jump online and do that for us. We'd be so, so very grateful. Tomorrow, some more stuff about school, which will be helpful for any parent of any child who isn't loving school right now. We talk to the author of the book, Teacher, Gabby Stroud, on the Happy Families podcast. Happy Families podcast.